Welcome to the Criminologist Podcast. Our goal here is to educate and enlighten our listeners, focusing on the latest and greatest evidence-based interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. And not only those factors which drive folks into crime, we also look at the reasons why people exit a life of crime. Also, we attempt to paint an accurate picture of that journey from the perspective of the justice-involved individual. Too often, our perceptions of those involved in the system are tainted by media-driven caricatures created to sell newspapers or movie tickets. This adds little to a healthy dialogue as to how to best address criminality. This podcast will avoid stereotypes and biases. We will endeavor to accomplish the first two goals in a way that keep you, the listener, interested and even entertained. And now, the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Thank you. Thank you. You're all too kind. Hello and welcome to episode 49 of The Criminologist podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. Going to spend the bulk of this episode really highlighting and flat out promoting an awesome webinar that I got to view just this last Monday. But one of the things that I scribbled down on my legal pad as I was listening to that webinar was the quote, hope creates motivation. Let's think about that for a moment, particularly those of us who are working under a risk need responsivity model. We know within that model the importance of the engagement process. We know that a lot of agencies utilize the motivational interviewing techniques of Miller and Rolnick to to get at that motivation piece. But I was a little blown away when I read that. Hope creates motivation. And again, within the risk need responsivity model, we don't bandy that term around so much, do we? Hope. We talk a lot about motivation, but we really don't talk about hope. And again, if you think of the oft referenced iceberg analogy, if we dig deeper down beneath the iceberg of motivation, what's really driving that is hope. Um, so let's maybe look at ways to augment hope to create motivation. As I said, I want to really dedicate this episode to a fantastic webinar that I set in on just this last Monday. I was fortunate enough to be in attendance for this webinar, which featured the work of Dr. Sarah Lewis and her team with Penal Reform Solutions over in the UK. Cam Stevens was also a part of this webinar. And if you're a loyal listener to the show, you might recognize those names. I've had both Dr. Sarah Lewis and Cam Stevens on this show as guest. I even appeared on Dr. Lewis's podcast. So we've got some history here. And as you can expect, if you know either of these two, I was blown away with what they had to see. The name of their webinar was entitled Service User Involvement. Empowering people in prison to make a difference. And one of the things that got my attention early in the presentation was a term being thrown about, and that term was service user involvement. For those of you who do not know the work of Dr. Sarah Lewis or Mr. Stevens, I would encourage you to go back and enjoy their episodes of when I interview them on this podcast. For context, though, I can tell you here and now that, as I said, they're based in the United Kingdom. And when they began talking about, quote, service user involvement, unquote, it it really took me a second to connect the dots before I figured out that they were referring to clients. Um, service users are the justice-involved individuals we service. Well, Right then and there, I grabbed my pen and I wrote that term down. I have been part of the crusade to have the field stop using the term offender. I, I wrote a piece for forensic mental health practitioner back in 2019 about the damning effects of this nomenclature. 
And of course, there are mountains of research on this topic. Labeling theory is alive and well in the criminal justice system. And I am always on the lookout for replacement terminology. And so I instantly fell in love with that term service user. But like I said, they were speaking of the importance of service user involvement. They subsequently shared their experience in a particular prison in England, HMP Hewell, that they used this approach with. But of course, they stress that this also applies to probation and parole populations. Again, this, this notion of involving the service user. At any rate, uh, as I let that concept sink in, the importance of service user involvement, I, I tried to put myself into the shoes of a, pro, a probationer or a parolee or an incarcerated individual, and I, I tried to imagine what that must feel like. That is, having your future mapped out with any input from you. And with that, I went into the laboratory and started concocting uh, this week's episode with that in mind. And so now I'm going to present to you a couple of vignettes from the Paragon players in which we turn the tables, if you will. And with the use of humor and hopefully some dry wit, uh, I bring you our first little skit here uh, entitled Little Shop of Horrors. And you can look that term up, that movie up, kids, and you'll know what I'm talking about here. Let's take a look at these x-rays, shall we? Okay. Looks like a small crack in that molar way in the back. If it's not giving the patient too much pain, we could take a wait-and-see approach. That's true, even though eventually he has a root canal in his future, does he not? Um, root canal? Probably yes, but if it's not bothering him, we could go years without having to cross that bridge. Well, if we're talking years, then actually I would prefer... Although, root canal treatment would allow the patient to keep the natural tooth. I would remove the infected or the inflamed pulp tissue, clean out the root canal, and replace it with a filling material. By keeping the natural tooth... The patient would not have to worry about bone loss. The tooth's root would continue to stimulate the bone so he could maintain his natural smile. How much would cleaning that out hurt exactly? I hear horror stories about root canals. Good point, doctor. Although on the flip side, treatment might weaken the tooth, would it not? I have read that it's possible for a tooth to become weaker after a root canal. After all, you have to drill through the tooth to get to the pulp, and additional decay might need to be removed. If the tooth is too weak to function, doctor, you may have to add a crown to it, wouldn't you? That would strengthen the tooth and allow the patient to use it like a natural tooth, correct? I really should check with my insurance company first to see what this is going to cost me out of pocket. Very astute of you, nurse. Of course, if we simply extract the tooth, we can take care of it right here, Right now. Prep the patient, please. Whoa, 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 wait! <laughs> was hopefully a good illustration of an experience that at least some of us could relate to. I've had my fair share of root canals, but I can assure you my experience was not like that. Because, of course, I was not invisible to the doctor and the hygienist. I was an integral part of the decision-making process. This illustrates for us, though, what it may feel like for our service users if we do not involve them in the process. The process of mapping out their very futures, their very lives. Let's have a little bit more fun and take another look at a scenario in which we're going to exclude the service user from the equation. Well, 
Welcome to Acme Oil Change. Yeah, just an oil change, please. Okay, so an oil change today, our top shelf synthetic oil and new windshield wipers. Nope, no wipers, just the oil change. And what was that about a synthetic? I need an oil filter replacement and radiator service in Bay 2, please. Oh, wait, time out, Bay 2. Is that me? And we're running a special on serpentine belt replacements. Today's your lucky day. What is happening? Snap to it, boys. We've got some tires to rotate. (laughs) Again, we are being a bit ludicrous to make a point, but I would contend that this is not too far off the mark for our criminal justice servers users. Even when well-intentioned probation officers are brokering services, they may not be doing it in an evidence-based way. We know from the research, uh, I believe Chris Trotter's done some work on this, a, a couple of approaches we can take for better results are things such as providing options to the service user. Rather than simply instructing a service user to attend chemical dependency treatment at a location familiar to the probation officer, provide the service user with a variety of options. We know this boosts the odds of following through dramatically. Also, when brokering services, it is key to make immediate and concrete referrals. Again, back to our dentist analogy. Why do you suppose your next dental appointment is always made before you leave their office? Because they know if they just give me a card and say, yeah, Joe, call us at your convenience for your next cleaning or checkup. They know that the odds of me doing so are dramatically less than if We just sit and do that together before I physically leave their office. It simply increases the the odds of follow through again, which is what we want when brokering services to our clientele. Or, of course, once again, stealing from Sarah and Cam and a, a short film of theirs that was highlighted in the webinar, which I'm going to share with all of you the link in the episode notes of this podcast. Simply ask the question, what would be most helpful for you in this moment? How impactful would that be for our service users if they heard those words more often? What would be most helpful for you in this moment? Think about how impactful those words would be for the individual receiving service, particularly when we look at how justice-involved individuals are historically placed in that decision-making process as to their very futures. Okay, back in a moment after a very quick word from our good friends at Criminal Guard. Tired of those pesky risk factors? Fed up with those nagging periods of reoffending? Just can't seem to keep on the straight and narrow? Then try Criminal Guard. Criminal Guard is our patented repellent against criminogenic need. Criminal Guard is effective against the risk factors of delinquent past, dysfunctional family relationships, substance misuse, lack of pro-social leisure activities, deficits around education and employment, negative peers, pro-criminal attitude, and a history of antisocial personality pattern. Simply apply Criminal Guard at the onset of delinquent behavior or when actuarial risk assessment warrants application. Criminal Guard works by attacking criminogenic need at the source while buffering against future risk. Inspired by general personality and cognitive social learning theory, Kimmenegaard identifies criminogenic need at its source. Then our top secret byproducts mimic pro-social modeling to elicit the onset of pro-social behavior. Once the cost for antisocial behavior outweighs the rewards, users begin seeing reductions in criminal deeds. Kimmenegaard is available in regular, mint, or jasmine scent. Find Kimmenegaard at all quality vendors, shops, and strip malls. Criminal Guard is not a substitute for proven evidence-based practices. Criminal Guard may cause mild discomfort or skin rash. In case of continued maladaptive behavior, users should subject themselves to proven core correctional practices. Criminal Guard has failed to result in significant effect sizes in recidivism reduction. Buyer beware, not sold in Canada. (laughs) 
I'm going to leave a link to the short film that Cam Stevens produced, as well as the entire webinar that he and Sarah Lewis and another colleague of theirs, a gentleman by the name of Daniel Reynolds, who is their rehabilitative culture lead over at HMP Hewell Prison. He was a big part of the project when Dr. Lewis and her team went into that facility and started working their magic. And as I have hopefully illustrated through my humorous scenarios earlier, it would be preposterous to think of exercising or removing the service user from critical decisions as to their service. Yet, sadly, that's somewhat the modus operandi for corrections, probation, and parole agencies. One of the things that Dr. Lewis talked about in the webinar was the importance of creating an organization that supports prisons or probation and parole agencies for that matter to develop a culture based on growth, humanity, and relationships. It, one of the questions posed and that I walked away from was thinking, how can we get service users to own their sentence plan or their case plans as we refer to them here in the States versus the practitioner owning that case plan? And again, if you're a probation and parole officer, you can likely relate to this phenomenon. We attempt to embrace case planning, but oftentimes when we take a step back, it's the probation officer's case plan or the judge's case plan or a combination thereof. But again, reflect on how often we are sort of in the same vein as I showed with the dentist analogy and the oil change analogy. We're kind of removing input from the service user or the client from that process. And they really need to own that case plan, to own that sentence plan. And again, I, I, I question sometimes how often we forget about that. And one of the things that Cam talked about that really kind of blew me away as well was he, he mentioned how moving away from crime can be uncomfortable. And again, I don't think the lay person can really relate to that issue with justice involved individuals and, and changing that trajectory and really getting into what's uncomfortable for them. He also said how prisons are a notoriously hopeless place. And I'll think back to what I said earlier. Hope creates motivation. So what's the effect of creating these institutions which are notoriously hopeless? You're removing that key element which creates motivation. And we know from the research, hope is a key ingredient for desistance, desistance from crime. So we really need to take a look at the element of hope in this change equation for our service users. Cam also had a great point when he said people want not just to be listened to, but have their input acted upon. So I would encourage you, or if, if you're working in a facility in particular, or even a probation or a parole officer, to think about how often you insert hope into the equation when you're supervising justice-involved individuals, service users, if you will. Okay, changing gears here somewhat, but if you listen to the show, you're aware that the Criminologist podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, more specifically our Criminologist Media Group division, which also produces the Criminologist YouTube channel. And again, if you follow us, you are aware that we try to, at times, take a critical look at how justice-involved individuals or service users are portrayed in the media. And so in that spirit, I was doing a deep dive on an Irish film that I stumbled across entitled The Cured. And I previously dedicated a couple of episodes to what I refer to as watch parties. And we, we sort of watch the film together. I also did this on YouTube with the benefit of some visuals to assist in the experience. But I thought it would take the time to wrap that up and conclude part three. What I'm not going to do is do a scene-by-scene scene, um, 
walk through, if you will, because the last third of the movie is really action packed. So a lot of sort of dead air and it also goes against my um, philosophy. I'm a huge anti-spoiler guy. So it just kind of killed me to walk people through and tell you how the film ends. But suffice to say, I want to put a bow on that project and end with some of my conclusions around that awesome film, The Cured. So the film on the surface is is sort of portrayed as a zombie movie. The movie description reads, A disease that turns people into zombies has been cured. The once infected zombies are discriminated against by society and their own families, which causes social issues to arise. This leads to militant government interference. So what we discovered watching the film earlier was that the, the film producers and director, writer, they're really using a zombie outbreak plague to shine a spotlight on all the issues with prisoner reintegration. Um, again, we see that individuals who have been quote unquote cured of the zombie virus uh, still face massive discrimination from friends and family and society at large for the deeds that they committed while roaming the earth, uh, attacking humans, um, killing people. So a lot of discrimination here. And it's, again, a bigger theme is really around forgiveness, which for those of us working in the field, we know this is a huge issue. It's this Again, we've talked about this binary approach. We take us versus them. And this film does a great job of of showing how that could really deter the process of reintegration and how really counterintuitive it, it is to take those approaches. The film does a good job of, you know, exploring how those individuals who are now cured of their zombie affliction, even after, again, they're vaccinated, they face discrimination around employment, around housing. Uh, Even folks who are willing to take them in face grief from society for taking in these so-called monsters, um, members of this sort of disenfranchised class, if you will. And again, if you watch the film through the lens of just as involved individuals being in the place of individuals who have been rehabilitated from their previous zombie past. It really does shine a light on what society does and doesn't do in, again, really deterring that reintegration process. If you have not yet seen the film, it is available to watch on Hulu for free, or you can rent it on Amazon for around $3.99. A great, fun, little independent film out of Ireland. You'll recognize some of the folks in the movie. Go ahead, give it a watch. I'd love to hear your interpretation of the movie as well. From the people who brought you Criminal Guard, it's Desistance Assistance. The makers of Desistance Assistance realized that examining the pathways into crime was only part of the solution. Practitioners also need to address the pathways out of crime and delinquency. That's why they developed Desistance Assistance. Desistance Assistance uses space-age technology to scan and determine where an individual falls on their criminal trajectory quickly differentiating between adolescent limited and life course persistence deviancy arcs. Desistance assistance then calculates and calibrates the requisite portions of our powerful key ingredients, human capital, social capital, and of course, identity transformation. Our secret elixirs augment these three key areas of change to accelerate the process of aging out of crime. Once educational and vocational achievements are mixed with pro-social friends and family, it's time for our unique identity tonics to do their job. These secret tonics affix to the user's narrative scripts and restructure them from that of condemnation script to redemption script. Once identity transformation occurs, behavioral changes on the way. Of course, binding all these ingredients together is our secret sauce of hope, agency, and self-efficacy. Find assistance assistance at all quality vendors, shops, and strip malls. 
Safety Desistance Assistance is available in vanilla, strawberry, or chocolate flavor. Desistance Assistance cannot overcome social bias and discrimination. Desistance Assistance cannot guarantee societal inclusion. Desistant individuals may still face hurdles and roadblocks as to employment, housing, and other institutional norms. Primary, secondary, and tertiary desistance not guaranteed. Individual results may vary. Not a substitute for proven strength-based approaches. Buyer beware must be purchased with Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. (laughs) Back next week with a fresh episode. In the meantime, you may contact the show or reach out to us through our website, theparagongroupllc.com for training or presentations as to evidence-based practices or implementation, or of course, the topic of desistance from crime. If you have questions or comments as to this podcast, feel free to contact the show via our email, the criminologist podcast at gmail.com. That's the criminologist podcast at gmail.com. Remember to follow us through our Facebook page or Instagram pages at the criminologist podcast. New fun images are being added all the time to those feeds. You don't want to miss out. We're also on Twitter at Crim Media Group. That, of course, is the Twitter handle for the Criminologist Media Group. Again, that's Crim, CRM, Media Group. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter as well. You can also connect with me, Joseph Arvidson, on LinkedIn and follow both the Criminologist Podcast and the Paragon Group on their respective LinkedIn pages. Lastly, if you've not already done so, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to the themes of this podcast. Merchandise is available. Reach out to the show if you are interested. And if you believe in what we're doing on the show, if you're part of the movement, please spread the word. Tell a friend or a coworker or a colleague about us. Ask them to subscribe to the show. And of course, do so yourself if you've already not done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them. There's only us. If you were involved in the decisions that affect your life in prison, what impact would it have? If residents were involved in the decisions that affect their life in prison, what impact would it have? Why is it important that residents' views and opinions are listened to? The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, training opportunities, or to contact the host, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. Click on the Contact Us tab in the upper right-hand side of the page. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening. The thoughts, statements, and opinions of the host and cast members do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers and are those of the host and cast themselves. Any discussion regarding client statements, behaviors, actions, or crimes are purely fictional and are used only for the purposes of example. Any examples that could be deemed to be related to an actual individual or individuals are incidental.